Praise the Lord. Good morning, church. My name is Matt Malik. Why don't you remain standing as we uh, join our faith together in a word of prayer. Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to gather together as fellow believers. And Father, our desire is, is to come to that place where we worship you unashamed, where we come to adore you for who you are, for what you've done, for what you're doing in the earth. And Father, our trust and our focus, let it be directed towards you even in this moment so that we can receive what you have for us, Father, through your word and through this gathering together. In the name of Jesus, we give you praise. And everyone in agreement says amen. Well, you can go ahead and be seated, take your seat. And, and again, um, my name is Matt Malik. I'm the lead pastor here at Refuge. And it's an honor to serve this congregation. And uh, I'm, I guess they call me the founding pastor. What that means is uh, 35 years ago, started this work with a handful of people that really had a hunger for God and a passion to do something significant for Jesus. And uh, now, these years later, we've seen God just impact the community in a special way through people like you and me. And, and I'm so glad just to be a part of that and be a part of what God is doing. A church is something that is just uh, more than an obligation. It's more than just doing something to gain favor with God because that's not what it's all about. It's, it's an opportunity to participate in the community that can make a difference in the city that we live in and the world that we live in. And, and so I'm, I'm blessed to be part of Refuge and glad that you're here too. And if you're visiting for the first time, we welcome you and we invite you just to receive whatever God has for you in the ministry of the Word through His Word. And so uh, I, I just want to touch a little bit about the year and gift uh, in your seat pocket, you'll find this really nice little pledge card. It says, My Pledge. And on here, there's a place for your name and address, a website. And then there's different opportunities for, for how you can uh, fill out this pledge. You can uh, either do a one-time gift and if you, as you've sought God and prayed about that and realizing that this is over and above your regular giving. And this is really for those that have a passion to build this kingdom and we have a mission in our community, and we want to reach this community for Jesus. And so uh, that requires sometimes giving of our substance. We can give of our time, and that's so important. We can give our prayers, and we can give in different ways. But we also can give financially, and, and we're encouraging you to do so. We have actually a goal of $170,000 as we launch into the next year. And these are projects that are directed towards um, what are the three on here? You can see it on here. People, projects, and property. We, we feel it's important to continue to reach out to the community through the uh, community picnic and other um, venues that we have planned in store as we bless our community and reach out. Also, certain projects of renovation around here and, and different things that need to be done, need to be addressed. Uh, maintenance is, is one of those things you just got to do. It's not always fun. But things get worn out, things need to be replaced, and so there's a number of those projects. And then property is dealing with uh, addressing the debt. And we have about $419,000 of debt in this ministry, which when you think about that, you might think, well, that's overwhelming. But it's only about 16.5% as far as the ratio of the total worth of, of this uh, property and, and land and all that. And so that's that's a small percent, but my conviction is that if we can terminate that, we want to, if we designate 100000 towards that, 45000 towards the projects, and 25000 towards the people outreach. But if we can terminate and reduce our debt by one-fourth, that gives us more that we can invest in forward ministry. And uh, so uh, our, our total debt of the actual mortgage is 227 but we purchased ministry vans, there's snow equipment and lawn equipment and other things that have been financed, uh, a project to do some renovations a couple years ago, short-term loan. So all of that we're targeting to eliminate. So what I want you to do, if you're prepared, you know what God wants you to do today. If you've already dropped an offering basket, that's fine as the host picked it up. But take this home with you and seriously pray about it. And come back next week, uh, or you can do it online even. And just indicate what your pledge would be. And you can space that out. 
however you want. You can do uh, monthly gifts, weekly gifts, or you can do it, just say, this is my pledge, and I'll get it to you when I get it to you sometime in the next year or before the end of this year. So uh, don't feel like, oh, I have to get it by year end. Uh, this is something that you can pledge to and commit to as, as we plan our directive as we uh, reach the community uh, and the financial realm. So, yeah, there's something people have heard me say, and our focus at Refuge is, is you know, uh, we, we want to develop a culture of generosity among the people. And really what that means is when everyone does their part, every need is met. And as you find out and, and discern what your part is in helping us meet this goal, every need will be met because we are committed to serve the purpose of God. I believe we're kingdom builders. We're, we've been called to build the kingdom of God. And so, amen. And I could certainly say more, but I want to thank you for your generosity as a congregation, as a people. And we're glad to do this thing together for the cause of Jesus. And ministering his gospel to the community and beyond. So, uh, we're going to share the word, but, I, you know, for those of you that are here for the first time, I have a reputation. And that reputation, I always have to tell a joke before I bring the word. And, and you know, I base this on a biblical principle. You need to understand that because Proverbs says that laughter works like a medicine. And so sometimes you need to be medicated before you hear what I preach, okay? <laughs> uh, not really, but uh, uh, so uh, this was sent to me, believe it or not, by Amy. And, and I, do, I do receive responses. So if you share something with me, if you get it to me, you can get it through me, okay? All right. Uh, this was from Amy. And she says, what kind of doctor is Dr. Pepper? The answer is a physician, F-I-Z-Z, -Z, okay? Yeah, okay, yeah, I, I thought that was pretty cute. And Anyway, I do have a Christmas joke, too. There was this minister that was invited over to a, a member of the congregation, the home, and they had a, a, a little four-year-old there, and, and, and the minister noticed a beautiful, ornate, nativity set under the tree. That was just really, like, really amazing. And so the minister, the pastor, said to the, uh, to the little four-year-old, said, what is that? What do you call that? And she looked up at him and said, Pastor, that's breakable. All right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's breakable because you don't touch that. <laughs> okay. Okay. How many of you parents have something that's breakable at home? Okay. Okay. Are we, were we the only ones that had that? Okay. You, you put it on a high shelf, okay, so they can't reach it. Okay. Anyway. Well, are you ready for the Word? We're going to get into the Word this morning. Uh, the, as you see behind me, we've been talking about, we're in a little mini-series called Unexpected. And, and last week, we talked about uh, Unexpected when we looked at the reference of what the season of year is that we're facing. Uh, when your whole world changes, there's sometimes things that are unexpected that causes your whole world to change. And, and it can be something that can be a positive thing or a negative thing. But all of us deal with the unexpected. And this is the season that focuses on Jesus' birth. Yet so much surrounding Jesus' birth was unexpected. Jesus came at an unexpected time. He came through unexpected people, people that you wouldn't think you would come through as far as, you know, social status and all that. He came in an unexpected place. Can you imagine being born in a barn or born in a manger? What a humble place of beginnings. He also brought unexpected love. When Jesus was born into this world, he brought unexpected love acceptance, and forgiveness to humanity. You know, some people think that God won't accept you because of your life, the mistakes you've made. But you, we find acceptance through Jesus. He accepts you just as you are. But will you come to him? Will you surrender your life to him? You can find acceptance in him, and he won't reject you if you come to him. You don't have to be good enough, smart enough, wise enough to to be accepted by Jesus. He accepts you 
as you are. That's the beauty of his love. That's an expression of his love that we need to understand. Now, we're going to fast forward, and I'm going to, the, the opening verse is actually Acts 2.22. We're fast forwarding back his, uh, past his uh, birth, and we're going to see a time when Peter, in Acts 2.22, and I'm reading from the Passion Translation for this particular verse, we see Peter on the day of Pentecost standing up after the Holy Spirit had fallen, and the, the 120 that were gathered in that room were filled with the Spirit. Peter began to preach a message as the community came out. And part of the message is this statement in verse 22 that Peter declared. It reads, Acts 2.22 in the Passion Translation, Peter continued, people of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus the victorious was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many powerful miracles, signs, and wonders through him. The title of this morning's message is Unexpected Miracles. You know, Jesus was a man of miracles. We see that he performed many miracles through his lifetime, and many things that revolve around his life required a miracle. And there's miracles that we can identify with. Realize that when something is unexpected, it's usually in relation to something we didn't see coming. We didn't see coming. When your boss gives you a Christmas bonus and you didn't expect it, well, I didn't see that coming. But isn't that a wonderful, you know, blessing to see a Christmas bonus come from your employer? No? Is, am I preaching to the right people here? Okay. No, I, I think, hey, I didn't expect that. Or I worked at a place. Now, this was pretty amazing that we got a Christmas bonus one year. And this was when I was a Bible uh, college student in Tulsa, Oklahoma. We got a Christmas bonus. I, apparently, the company did very well. Not only did we get a regular paycheck, but we got three additional paychecks to match the first, the regular one that we got for that week. Hey, now that's a bonus. You know, four checks in one? Yeah, I, 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 that was unexpected. I didn't expect that. But it was certainly a blessing in my life. Or what about when you're driving and a deer jumps out in front of you? What's your reaction? Oh, I didn't expect that. If you're in Wisconsin, you need to expect that at some point or another, right? <laughs> but then the second part of that is as you swerve to miss the deer, you didn't hit the deer, it just brazes alongside of your car and you have some fur caught in your rearview mirror. That happened to me once, by the way. And, and, I, and then the second aspect of the unexpected, wow, I thought I was going to hit him. It was unexpected to see the deer, but then it was unexpected because I didn't hit the deer. So that was a blessing part of it, okay? And so, see, there's a contrast between expected and the unexpected. What about the unexpected? And we can think of events that were unexpected that may have changed your whole world. They could be positive. They could be negative. And I believe we should come to church. I shared this last week. We should come to church expecting the unexpected. See, God desires to do something unexpected in your life even this morning. Something that you may have come through the doors with not realizing that God wanted to do something in your life. Maybe you didn't expect it. So expect the unexpected. Expect that God's going to do something. Some of you need to be set free in an area of your life where you've been tormented, where you've been burdened, where you've been plagued, where you've been bound in sin or some habit. Expect God to meet you this morning. You know, there's something about the God that we serve. He meets us at a point of need. He'll meet you where you need him the most, in your greatest struggle, in your greatest pain. God will meet you in that place. And he's not going to leave you there. He's going to bring you out of that place. He's going to bring you to a place of wholeness, a place of freedom, a place of strength. He'll take you from weakness to strength, from confusion to 
understanding. We serve a God who meets us right where we're at. And that's the beauty of the cross, and that's the beauty of the mission and the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus does not expect us to come up to his level. He came down to our level. And that's the whole story of, of, of what happened when Jesus was born and, and him coming to this world. He came down to our level. Why? To take us up to his level. Amen? And there's so much we could say along those lines. Now, there's a conflict, and, and we talk about miracles. Maybe you need a miracle this morning. Maybe you were believing God for a miracle, and, and it didn't happen. And there's a conflict between miracles and science because uh, there's some, obviously, that don't believe in miracles. They deny any kind of miracle because if science can't prove it, they won't accept it or believe it. They just may not understand it if there's no explanation for it. But science may not be able to explain a miracle because miracle often defies science and goes contrary to the laws of nature. For example, Jesus walking on the water, that the laws of gravity demand that you can't do that, right? But yet Jesus did. So that's a miracle because it defied the very laws of nature. And see, this explains the reason why science may have a difficult time to find a reasonable explanation of miracles that we see in the Bible. Because if science can't explain it, then science can't believe it or receive it, okay? Now, yet we see that miracles happened, they happen, and they're still going to happen. And, and you know, so our goal in this morning's message is to move you from a place of the unexpected to the expected, from a place where you begin to expect miracles and the miraculous working in your life, and, um, you know, and, and so that you won't be shocked by the miracles or stand in unbelief. Oh, I can't believe this happened. But to see a miracle and say, Father, you are faithful. You have moved in this time and this season. And so part of that is, regardless of your past history, is for you to begin to determine to develop a miracle mentality and have a mentality that is, is directed towards the miraculous and God moving in supernatural ways in your life and the lives of your loved ones. And so I believe that the world needs to be shocked into reality. It really does. And for that to happen, it's going to take a miracle, right? It's going to take a miracle for this world to be shocked into that reality of that, that God is alive in this earth. A miracle is something that science can't explain, but yet faith can receive. I'll share that again. A miracle is something that science can't explain, but faith can receive. A miracle is not explained by science. It is, is, it's explained by faith. And faith is simply trusting God to do what we can't do. And faith is living in this limited life in an unlimited way because there's so many limitations that are set, but faith takes the limitations off. And, and the children of Israel were, were rebuked um, by Moses because they limited the Holy One of Israel. Here God is moving, splitting the Red Sea, causing this food to appear, to fall, you know, fed by manna, and God providing water for them in the middle of a desert. He's doing all these miraculous things, but yet Moses still rebuked them because they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited God by not believing and trusting in Him more. And, and see, all things are possible and nothing is impossible with God. Okay? All things are possible and nothing is impossible with God. Luke 18, 27 declares, but he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. So just mark that down. Anything that's impossible for you is possible with God. So he's not limited by your impossibilities of what you can't do. And then Mark 9, 23, in the context when Jesus was healing a boy with an unclean spirit, Jesus said to his father, he said to him, if you can, if you can believe, he's saying, 
all things are possible for the one who believes. See, possibilities come into reality when we believe, when we put our faith out there, okay? And, and so there's a possibility that is waiting to be activated when you believe. See, miracles can happen when you least expect them. And miracles can happen when you believe as a result of faith in His Word, of faith in His promises. And if we define the word miracle, it's simply an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. A a miracle is a surpassing and welcome event that is not explained by natural or scientific laws and is therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency, okay? And now, I don't have time to get into it, but the question a lot of people say, why don't miracles happen? We were believing in God, this didn't happen. And I don't have time to discuss that, but I am going to encourage you in this one word, trust. Actually, two words, trust God. Trust God. Because sometimes we can presume something. Sometimes we, we may not know all the details concerning the situation. And because of that, regardless, we still have to trust God and look to Him in spite of whatever does happen or does not happen. And, and see, we live with more of an ex- unexpected mentality than an expectant one. I'll say that again. We live with more of an unexpected mentality than an expectant one. See, what is unexpected is usually something you have not anticipated or even planned for. And, you know, when you're expecting, there's anticipation. Uh, That requires planning and preparation, correct? Such as a mother expecting the birth of a child. So there's, there's living in that expected state. And it's interesting how that term has even been attributed to a, a woman having a pregnancy or during her pregnancy. You know, so she's expecting. Oh, oh, okay. What's she expecting? Well, she's expecting to have a child that's going to be born in, in their household. And so then there needs to be plans, preparations to become ready for this child to be born. And how many uh, newborns do we have here this morning? other than Michaela and Andy, little crew there. He's, I put him to sleep every time I preach, I tell you. <clears throat> now, when he's uh, 12 years old, that won't be so good, but, but for now, it's fine. He loves the sound of his grandpa's voice. He really does. Okay. It's soothing. It's calming. And hopefully, it's not irritating. Although, this last week, I was over there, and I sneezed. And it caused trauma in that little boy's life. He began to wail and cry, and he wouldn't stop. I felt so bad. And, of course, Pastor Deb was on top of me. Hey, you know, don't, you know. <laughs> anyway, yeah. we, we got through that. We got through that, right? We got through it, didn't we? Okay, all right, good. Good. Just so we know we're good, okay? <laughs> that, that was close. Amen. All right. So, uh, now I want to, as we, I'm going to, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I want to have a little bit more of an extended worship at the end. Um, uh, So, but I I do want to talk about the chain of unexpected miracles, and we look at the life of Jesus. The chain of unexpected miracles, number one, the miracle of his birth, and I have three points here. The first is the miracle of his birth, and Matthew 123 The scripture reads, and this is actually a quote from Isaiah 7, 14. It says, Behold, the virgin shall shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the miracle was a virgin conceived. Now, that's a miracle. That's impossible. Natural science would say, no, no, that can't happen. But yet it happened. In Luke 2, verse 10 and 11, the Scripture also reads concerning his birth, his actual birth that's recorded in Scripture. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior 
who is Christ the Lord. So the virgin birth was Jesus born, God's son, God taking human form and being born into this earth. Now, the second chain of miracles we see is the miracle of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And we see it in the book of Acts, chapter 10, verse 37 and 38, because this addresses uh, an aspect of Jesus' miracle ministry. And it, it actually reads, he's actually speaking to Cornelius. It was a, a, um, somebody that was part of the military. He was not of Jewish descent. He was a Gentile. And Peter was invited to share the gospel with him and his family. And, and he states, Peter states in this message, he says, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. So this statement, these verses address Jesus' ministry in the earth from the time he was baptized. And before he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he, there's no recorded miracle until after he was filled with the Spirit because Jesus operated in his humanity. And, and realize, and I, I'll just throw this out, Jesus made a statement. He said, what I've done, whatsoever I've done in John 12, 14, whatsoever I've done shall you also do. And greater works than these shall you do because I go to the Father. Jesus commissioned us to carry on his work on this earth. So that means you and I, every one of us can have a miracle ministry. It's available for us. But that's another message. That's another series. Maybe we'll get to that at some point. Because there's a ministry of the believer where God can work through you to do extraordinary things. And we see that in Apostle Paul's life. He, he addressed that in Romans 15. Now, we see on the day of Pentecost, in Acts 2.22, this is the opening verse we shared. I'm going to share it again. Peter continued. This is from the Passion Translation once again. People of Israel, listen to the facts. Jesus the victorious was a man on a divine mission whose authority was clearly proven. For you know how God performed many powerful miracles, signs, and wonders through him. So that was a statement concerning his earthly ministry, which lasted for three and a half years. Can you imagine Jesus in that day, the significance and the impact that that made among the people then? And that message and, and, and what he did impacts us even today. The world today reflects and looks back at what Jesus did when he came to this earth the miracles, the signs, the wonders. But yet it takes faith to believe. It's, you, you need to believe, did Jesus really exist? If he did, then, which he did, okay, but you have to determine that on your own. Is Jesus real? Well, he can make himself real to you if you invite him into your life. He will show himself to you and make himself known in your life because he's alive and well today. And that leads to the um, the third aspect in this chain of miracles is the miracle of his resurrection, where he conquered death. Uh, continuing in this passage, we see in verse 23 in Acts 2, and this is also the Passion Translation, it says, this man's destiny was prearranged. That's in reference to Jesus. For God knew that Jesus would be handed over to you to be crucified and that you would execute him on the cross by the hands of lawless men. Yet it was all part of his predetermined plan. Verse 24, God destroyed the cords of death and raised him up because it was impossible for death's power to hold him prisoner. So this speaks of, of his death, his burial, his resurrection, which is a miracle. Jesus was raised from the dead by the power and the glory of God. And that resurrection power is, is resident within any, within any believer that receives him and accepts him as our Lord and Savior. I want to conclude the message with addressing two words. Two words. 
And the two words are, if only. If only. If only are the saddest words in the English language, or the two of the saddest words. I'm sure there's other sad words. But they're two of the saddest words in the English language that you could ever speak. And I've determined in my own life not to have to say, if only. Because when we say those words, if only, it can convey regret, lost opportunities, mistakes, and disappointments. If only I would have known that the speed limit was 45 miles an hour. I wouldn't have got this ticket, okay? Um, I don't know if that ever happened to you. I got a warning. <clears throat> if only I wouldn't have been in such a hurry. And you can dot, 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 add, you know, the rest of the sentence. Sometimes the words, if only, are associated with tragedy. Sometimes the words can be associated with regret. If only we had spent more time with the kids when they had the opportunity. You know, my dad, when he um, was on his deathbed a couple of years ago, that's the thing that he said. If only I would have spent more time with you kids when you were growing up. Because he was gone. He was working all the time. And those are words of regret. If only, you know, people on their deathbed, they don't, always say, they don't ever say, if only I would have put in more time at the factory. They don't say that. If only. There's a story, and I'm going to tell this as briefly as I can as we bring this message to a close. Um, back in 2006, um, we were coming back from Minneapolis. I got a phone call from the church office. And it was a man that was on his deathbed, and his family had gathered, and we were coming, and they had just taken him off life support. He was dying of emphysema. Uh, they took him off life support, and they gave him about two hours to live. And, and I got there about an hour after they removed his, his breathing tube and uh, respirator and all that. And the families gathered around, and I began to speak to his wife, and I said, has he made his peace with God? His, his first name is Roy. Has Roy made his peace with God? And she said, yes, he rededicated his life to the Lord about two weeks ago. And this was a man that kind of wavered. He'd, he'd gone to church, been away from church, had struggles, addictions in his life, um, and just never really kind of got on track. And so I'm there to minister comfort and strength to this family, and, and I, I looked to the family members that were gathered and said, have each of you said your goodbye? Have you released him to go and let him know you love him and it's okay? He said, yeah, we've all done that. And so we join hands. We're gathered around his bedside with his family, and I couldn't pray. I was going to just pray, Lord, peacefully receive him into your presence. And I, I couldn't pray in that moment, and and I'm saying, okay, what's up, Lord? Uh, I was like at this impasse. And then I felt like the Lord said, ask Roy if he has any last requests. I said, okay, this is interesting. So I turned to Roy, and I said, Roy, I, I believe I, I need to ask you if you have any last requests. Now, the man could barely breathe. He could barely talk. He, he was speaking in gasping words, and, and he, he basically said, I the Lord for new lungs. Did you hear what I said? I asked the Lord for new lungs. And I was like stunned. And I, thought, and I looked at the family. I said, should we honor a dying man's request? I said, let's pray that God give him new lungs. And if God does, he's not going to die. He'll live. And they all looked at me and said, okay. And so we prayed, Lord. And I don't even remember how I phrased that prayer, how I prayed. I just remember just praying that God would give him new lungs. And so I, I said goodbye to the family, and I said, call me when, you know, just when he passes. 
And so that evening, it was getting late in the evening, didn't get a phone call. I'm thinking, well, maybe he's still with us. The next morning, about 8 a.m., I get a phone call from his wife, and she's all excited on the phone. And she said, Pastor Matt, Roy is still with us. And the doctors don't know what to make of this. In fact, he's just had breakfast, and he hasn't had breakfast in, you know, I don't know how long it was, but it had been at least a week he hadn't eaten a, a, a meal. And... And I said, so what do the doctors say? We said, if he's still with us to the weekend, they're going to move him to um, the nursing home. And so the weekend goes by. He's in the nursing home. Two weeks later, he's, he goes home completely, 100% healed by the power of God. And, and I can remember, yeah. Got... Now, I can and remember sitting with him and talking with him, and I said, Roy, this is an amazing miracle. He said, yeah, my doctor calls me his miracle man. And so I said, Roy, God has given you an opportunity. You were at death's door. You need to get back into church. You need to be in the Word. God, I believe, has a ministry for you. He can use you. This testimony can encourage others, inspire their faith. And he said, yeah, yeah. Okay. And we have Joan here who, who does healing classes. I said, we, you need to get connected with her, uh, learn the word about healing so you can maintain this healing. Um, the next Sunday, his family came, but he wasn't with them. This was like about maybe two weeks later. And um, Roy never came back to church. And he had been to church maybe 20 years before, off and on. And I'd reach out to him encourage him. He went back into his addiction. He was an alcoholic. Went back to smoking. And sad to say, well, 2008, I did his funeral. So the words I say, if only, if only he would have got back in church. If only he would have taken this opportunity and done something with it. God extended his life, but if only he would have did something with this. Now, if only moments, I want to ask you this question. Is there one in your life that is causing you pain and heartache, if only? And, and this morning, the worship team can come up here right now. Um, maybe you're going through something, and... And I didn't know this message would come out this way. But in prayer last night, the Lord showed me some things. That he wants to bring healing. He wants to bring hope. He wants to help you in heartache, to get through crises, to get past the roadblocks that are holding you back. He wants you to walk in greater freedom than you've ever known or experienced. And so we don't want to live life if only. And even here today, if only... I would have responded to God when it's at church on December 22nd, 2019. If only I would have opened my heart to Jesus and allowed him to take my life. I want to extend the invitation to you. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor, you know, I've never really committed or dedicated my life to Christ. But I'm willing to today to open my heart to Jesus, to put my faith and trust in him to receive him as my Lord and Savior. And maybe you're here and you've been away from God. You've walked with him for time. And you're here because maybe God's tugging at your heart and, and wanting you to come back and make things right, get, make peace with God, and get back on track with him. We extend an invitation to you with every head bowed, nobody looking around. If you're here and you know you need to give Jesus your heart. You know you need to receive him as your Lord and Savior. You know you need to rededicate your life to him. I want you to lift your hand because God's going to meet you in a significant way if that's you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Since God's tug and God, okay, thank you. I see that hand too. God's going to meet you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your honesty. 
Let's stand up together. Now, normally we do like one closing song and we dismiss. But we're going to do a second song. The first is Waymaker. Because you see, so many people don't know that God's made a way for them. A way for you to get right with him, to receive his forgiveness for your sins. A way for him to turn your situation around and allow him to become involved with your life, to set things right. This could be the day that your whole world changes. How desperate are you for an encounter with God? I believe God wants to meet you here. We're going to open the altars up. If anyone wants to step out of their seat and come up here, especially those of you that raised your hand today, you make your way to the front. God's going to meet you. I can promise you that. You know, this isn't about so much the man who's bringing the message. It's about the message that God has given me to share with you that I believe is going to be impactful in your life if you receive it. But I want to lead you all in this prayer, believer's prayer, and then we're going to worship. We're going to invite you to come to the front. And if you want to make your way up here right now, feel free to. We're going to just spend a little longer worshiping God, but we're going to get you out at a good time too, so don't worry about that. Repeat after me, especially those of you that raised your hand, in this believer's prayer. Heavenly Father, I open my heart to you. I believe in you, Jesus, that you died for my sins on the cross, that you rose from the dead to give me life. Jesus, I repent from my sins. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse my life. Make my life what you want it to be. I surrender to you. Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing the song, make your way to the front and, and, and allow this to be a time between you and God. And if there's an if only that's tormenting you, especially I want you to step out because God's going to meet you today in a significant way. <laughs>